The holidays are a time to feel and create joy. And what could be more joyous than the look on her face as she unwraps a stunning new jewelry piece from Blue Nile? How about getting 50% off your purchase? Blue Nile offers premium quality, priced below traditional retail. Their online experts are available 24-7 to answer any questions and make sure you've picked the perfect gift. For a limited time, you can get 50% off at BlueNile.com. That's 50% off at BlueNile.com. Looking for a fun way to win 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash play100 and use code play100. That's code play100 at prizepicks.com slash play100 for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Hello, this is international football commentator Derek Ray, and you're listening to the Ranks FC podcast. Hello, Rank Squad, and welcome to Ranks FC. My name is Jack Collins. I'll be your host there as we break down Ange Postacoglu's appointment as the new Tottenham Hotspur manager. We're going to be joined by a variety of people throughout today's show. But for now, I have the transfer guru, Mr. Dean Jones, with me. How are you doing, mate? I'm good, mate. Thank you. Um, I'm sure Tottenham fans are too, to finally have a manager after over two months um, uh, of no boss and no direction. Must be a nice day to be thinking, yeah. okay, we're settled. We can get into the transfer market now. Well, this is it, isn't it? It's been such a long time since that Conte rant at Southampton that led to two interim managers taking mm. hold of the club and then a couple of bosses turning away from the job, Spurs turning away from others. It's been a very strange couple of months, I would imagine. But it does feel like having someone in place is one of the first steps to, to getting things back on track for Spurs. It's helpful, yeah. It's definitely helpful, yeah. 72 days it took um, to replace Antonio Conte. And they've gone with someone I didn't think they'd go with. Um, you know, when this all first started, Nagelsmann was the guy that was immediately uh, in view as the most obvious person to try and come in from a Tottenham point of view. They obviously distanced themselves from that um which was quite interesting um but since then there's been a couple of other names in the frame too that have been and gone and they're going for someone who's low profile let's face it this is a low profile appointment um ambitious um Daniel Levy will hope exciting that's the sort of brand of football that we're expecting here but this is a a manager who's you know, uh, 57 years old, as we've not been able to forget. You know, there was the early reports. Um, I think it was from the Times saying, you know, one of the one of the worries of Tottenham is Postecoglou is 57 years old. Um, you're like, why is that a big problem? I think you know, 57 year olds should be generally fine. Um, but that was in line with the fact that Tottenham, I think, ideally would have had like an emerging, young, cool, upcoming manager that was going to make a big statement in the dressing room and in you know, his philosophy on football. And they have got that. They've got a guy who is making his mark on, on football. Um, just a lot later in life, really. Postacoglu, pretty late on the scene um, in terms of making his mark in elite level football. He hasn't been uh, in any of Europe's top five leagues up to this point. Um, but he's, he's ready to give this a go. And it's not like he hasn't been successful. The clubs that he's been at... South Melbourne, Brisbane Raw, uh, Yokohama Marinas, Celtic, been at the Australian national team too. You know, they're they're not the sort of clubs that you can guarantee success from, but 
He's won 14 trophies across the his time at those clubs, and he's just led Celtic to a treble. So wherever he's been, he has been successful. This is just the next step up. And when you talk there about me comparing it to Graham Potter, Graham Potter got a long, long contract and had never managed a dressing room at that level. The egos, the expectations, all those sorts of things, the transfer targets. And that's what Ange postacoglu has got to deal with here. Can he handle um, players who are earning 100, 100, 150 grand a week and not being in his team confronting him over that? Can he handle Tottenham, you know, working in line with a sporting director, whoever that ends up being, and obviously the other guys that they're bringing in around the recruitment staff and Daniel Levy, identifying targets, bringing them in. Don't forget at Celtic, like, a big part of his success was that he was involved heavily in recruitment. He was using players that he'd identified from his player, say from his time in Japan and and bringing them into Celtic and they were great. Are those same players going to be able to do that if he was to turn to them in the Premier League? Maybe one, but generally, no, I don't think so. So you look at a different tier of player here. Can he keep Harry Kane? Who's going to be the next captain of Tottenham? Hugo Lloris is leaving. You'd say, well, if Kane's there, probably is going to be Harry Kane. But if Kane's not there, then you're looking at a situation here which is pretty unbelievable. Tottenham would be going into next season, potentially, with a manager that's never managed in the Premier League before or any of Europe's top divisions, without Harry Kane, who they've hung their season on year after year after year, and without Hugo Lloris, who is their captain. That is potentially what situation we could be in in August. Now, we don't know yet. Like We don't know what will happen with Harry Kane and, and so on and so forth. But there are definitely risk factors here attached with this appointment. But anyone that listens to us on, on Patreon will know that we are kind of excited about this, aren't we? Like They're giving a chance to someone who has a very, very good footballing philosophy. And as long as he can start well, has the opportunity to bring excitement against Tottenham. Last season was dull. It was rubbish. It was boring. Their game plans were horrible a lot of the time. Postacoglu shouldn't be like that. He's got a four-year contract. As long as the first four months of this job go well, he might get a chance to actually get stuck into that. I think there's a couple of things at play. Um, one of them is that Postacoglu has always espoused attacking front foot football it, to the detriment of his teams at some point. And, you know, we've seen Celtic in, in Europe not give any quarter in terms of the way they're going to approach games and actually struggle with it because teams like Real Madrid and RB Leipzig have just been able to kind of run them over in, in, in kind of playing those ways. And so... There does have to be a period of adaptation. It's also worth considering that he didn't actually start particularly brilliantly at Celtic. It took a while for him to instill his philosophy, his footballing ideals into this Celtic side. And so that's something that Spurs fans need to be aware of, that it might not be a day dot starter. It might be something that kind of really kicks on and takes some time to grow into. And and I do think that that's important. And it, it, it makes a, a big difference here. If, if you give Ange time and you give him love, then I think that this is something that has the long-term potential to work. Part of it, you know, at Celtic was that connection that he built with the fans. And there's this amazing TIFO the Celtic fans did. And there's a quote from, from an old Irish rebel song about uh, James Connolly. And it says, leading them with a, was a mighty man with his fist raised to the sky. And in the middle of it, it's just got a picture of Ange Postacoglu with, you know, his hand into the air. There was the kind of signature celebration. It's one of the most, you know, amazing TIFOs I've seen in, in recent years. And, you know, that two-way relationship that they've built between the fans and Ange himself was a huge part of the way that the machine was able to motor on, they were able to overcome any sort of down periods. I think he needs to build something like that very quickly at Spurs. But I do think there's something in the fact that this is a manager. And I do think that Spurs, their last few managerial appointments, Conte, Mourinho, have felt in some ways that they're bigger than the club, that they've come in as the saviour figure. Ange won't feel like that. He will feel like this is a club that he has to work for and earn its trust. He won't be there in press conferences, sniping and whining about the fact that things haven't gone his way. He will take responsibility, will shoulder responsibility, and he will try to move the club forward in his own way. And I think 
that considering how toxic it's got at Spurs under both of those managers, having someone who believes that they have a duty to work for the club and to try and make things better, aside from having the club kind of pander to every need that they want, is probably a good thing in the current shape that we're in at Spurs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, one thing he would have had at Celtic that he doesn't have at Tottenham is European football. Now, that's really interesting. But honestly, I think a massive positive for him for his first season at Tottenham to not have to balance that out, to not have to shoulder the the squad management and the rotation, not to need the same depth numbers, I think is a real positive. If you see how Arsenal used their their little time out of Europe to their uh, to their benefit under Arteta, it gave him a platform to quickly relaunch. And I think that Postacoglu will, will look at that too as an advantage for him because, you know, there's no doubt Tottenham are, are going into the transfer window with with hopes and uh, certain levels of expectation. I mean, there are already reports out that, you know, one of the things that will be in place is like there's not an extensive transfer war chest here. Like they're not going to be pushed by Postacoglu to spend, spend, spend. Like if you think back to Conte, he was constantly going to war for what he felt was needed. And it was like spend, spend, spend on this, that and the other. Um, And Conte might have been right, to be honest, when you look back at it. But I think now with Postacoglu, there'll be a a mix. He's going to look to get better out of what they've already got at their disposal. And then just add those few little pieces, whether it's David David Raya, whether it's James Madison, um, you know, what what centre-back do they get through the door? Um, you know, there are a couple in Serie A that are being linked as well as people like Max Kilman. So there are some interesting options there and, and Tottenham will make, you know, three, four signings for the first team. But yeah, it's not going to be an extensive overhaul. And I think that that's okay because they haven't got European football to worry about and he can just be single-minded. Like, let's take the cup competition seriously. He will do that. I think that's probably been important to them, seeing that he's won the treble at Celtic. That means he's taken every competition seriously and, like, seen that, like, what that does to the fan base. And Tottenham yeah. fans should take hope from that too. Like, if Tottenham win the Carabao Cup next season... That is great. That is a massive step forward from where they've been in recent times. And when you look back over all the stuff that their managers have won, none of them have really won anything with them. So they just need to get a cup under their belt. And I think, yeah, being allowed to focus on that and then just put Europe on the back burner for a year will be a really good thing. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I mean, there are parallels and I'm sure Spurs fans won't enjoy me you know, drawing them, but to Arteta's first season at Arsenal, right? Where he didn't have to worry about that secondary element of playing in in, in European football and, and having to, to deal with that kind of double whammy of the fact that you have midweek games. I, I think it's important. Look, there are question marks over lots of things. There are question marks over the build-up of this Spurs squad. There is question marks over how much time he's going to be given. There are question marks over Harry Kane's future. And we're going to get into all of them with a friend of this pod brought back for... I think maybe now he's the record appearance holder uh, of an on ranks FC permanent member. And we're going to be talking to Mr. Harry Brooks uh, about what he thinks about the Ange Postacoglu situation. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Ranks FC, where I'm delighted to say we're once more joined by, well, maybe the friend of this podcast, Mr. Harry Brooks. Harry, how you doing, mate? Yeah. Good as gold, mate. Always a pleasure speaking to you guys or just yourself today. Um, but uh, yeah, no, absolutely fantastic. And uh, thanks again for having me on. No, no, it's always a pleasure and always, always wonderful to have you on. And I thought in particular, this was a, a good time. Ange Postacoglu announced as the new Tottenham manager. I mean, first off, before we dig into the kind of positives and negatives, I thought what was really interesting, something you tweeted this morning, was that it feels, I think, from a Spurs perspective, exciting to be a fan again. And I know this isn't something shared across the whole fan base right at this point, but I completely agree with you. This is what you want from a manager, someone who's coming in, promising to play attacking football, playing, promising to to try to get everything going again. And it feels, I think, for the first time in a while, like an appointment that fits Spurs and, you know, and and both way around. It's an appointment that's good for Postacoglu. It's an appointment that's good for Spurs. And one where it feels like he's going to really buy into what the club stands for and also what fans want. I think so. I mean, obviously, where I work in football, it's it's hard to be a fan. But you know, I grew up supporting Spurs. 
and I still go to the games to spend time with my dad. And just the last the last few years, the, the club just it hasn't known what they are or what they're trying to be. And you know, me saying that I'm going to feel like a fan again wasn't a dig at Jose or Conte or, or even Nuno, all of all, all of whom are fantastic managers. Um, but it was just very, very clear that, that their visions didn't align with the club's visions, and it just became a mess. And you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't a fun place to be, which is not what you want as football. You know, people need to remember as well. Like you didn't first start loving football as a six year old or an eight year old or a ten year old think because of the trophies and the silverware you've done it because of just that love you feel for the game and I think that what will at least happen is I think that the club and the manager they'll at least now be aligned in terms of the direction they're taking and I think that it will the positivity of that will 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 carry through and you know I, I personally don't believe in a modern way of playing I believe that any style can work if you believe in it but there is no question that you know, fans and I guess players, they, they want to be playing in, in you know, teams that and under coaches that allow them to, to be creative, that allow them to, to attack, to dominate the ball, to, to attack the opposition. And, you know, there's no question that is what Ange Postacoglu is about. And I think that because of that, he will definitely get the fans on board when they see what he's trying to do. I think he'll get the players on board with that or he should hopefully get the players on board with that. And I think that, the overall positivity around the club will will you know go up. I think that obviously um, there's a lot to fix, which I'm sure we'll get into. Um, it's certainly not coming into an easy situation, but yeah, I think it'd be nice to go to the game again and feel like okay, there's a direction that the club are going in, and I think from that perspective, I'll be able to enjoy being a fan when I watch Tottenham as opposed to, you know, working in the game and then hoping to enjoy the football when not really enjoying it. I agree. I think it is an important facet. You know, yes, there are all these bits and bobs about where Spurs have been, where they were, where Mourinho and Conte came in to, to you know, in, win trophies and make that difference. Spurs aren't at that position anymore. And I think it's also important to kind of bear that in mind that whilst, yes, obviously every club wants to go and win things, it is about finding something that, that matters. And I think Andrew's a good man. I think he's a good man manager. And I think he presents a vision of football that fans can align with. And, and all of those things are, are positives for Spurs. But talking of, I was going to get you to walk me through a couple of the, the upsides of this, a couple of the downsides of this. And then I've got a couple of questions for you as well. So I'll hand the floor to you. I think what I love most about Ange Postacoglu, and this is where I was putting him ahead of Arnie Schlott um, for my personal preference as a manager. I think... Speaking from a coach's perspective, a lot is made nowadays of what you would call like the first phase, second phase and third phase of build-up. So a lot of precedence is set on the first phase of build-up, how teams start from the back, how they use the goalkeeper, how they move the ball from defense, goalkeeper, defence, into midfield, etc. And it seemed, it's almost as if, if you do the first two phases in a certain way, you're seeing as this incredibly progressive coach and you know, you're using the goalkeeper and building out from the back and you're amazing and all this kind of stuff. And that's actually not the hardest thing in the world to coach. It can be hard to get right, but it's not very hard to, to coach patterns of play to build out. And I think that when you look at managers like that, is that yes, they can be very good at building out in the first two phases, but when the ball goes into the final third, if the team is sat deep in a compact block or a deep block, whatever you want to call it, and there's not much space, they can often they struggle because their their patterns aren't breaking down the opposition. It becomes stale, boring, slow. You even saw that with Pochettino. You know, a lot of the times when Spurs when, when teams would sit back and deep against Spurs, they wouldn't really know how to how to break them down. For me, you know, the hardest thing to coach in terms of a group perspective is is attacking at the final third play, chance creation. I think Ange Postecoglou is is a master at that. You know, people can say all they want about oh well the league that he's playing in is far lesser quality and yes that is there is an, there is there is a conversation to be had about that but it doesn't mean that his ideas aren't translatable to higher leagues you know his his ideas is definitely translatable to higher leagues you know the the rotations in the final third the fluidity the understanding from players of when to slow down when to put their foot on the ball when to speed up when to make aggressive runs forward all of that is re- translatable to any league especially uh, what should be a team with better players, you know. Um, so I think that's what I'm most excited about is that, yes, he will have ways of building out from the back as a lot of co- as most coaches, or all coaches do. But it's the, the fact that I think that he will have really interesting and exciting ideas to break teams down in the final third. And that, for me, is where 
where the money will be made, you know, um, and that's what I'm looking most forward to. Yeah, I mean, there are there's two sides to this coin. It's a, it's a sword with with two edges, right? In that Andrew's teams often score an absolute bucket load of goals. They often concede them as well. But that's the that's the kind of risk that it feels that Spurs are taking on this. It's not necessarily whether the ideas are translatable, as you say. If you're a good enough coach, the better players you're coaching, the more that the ideas will work, right? That that's the the kind of element yeah. that works right from the bottom of this. But I do think that. In terms of entertaining football, I think Celtic have scored the most goals this season since something like 1937. This is yeah. something that has, has broken record after record after record. The team have, you know, yes, taken a little while to get into it in, in that first season. But this year, Celtic have felt like an unstoppable force. Yes, they are the dominant side in the division. Fine. No problem. That's OK. We have to deal with that. And that's something that's going to be a challenge in terms of dealing with things later down the line. But... Just the way that, as you say, he's been able to slice apart teams who have gone, right, there's no way we're going to open up against this Celtic side. We've seen what they can do to other people. And he's gone and stuck six past them in the first half of games at times, I think is testament to those coaching methods. Yeah, I think so. You know, I think that the, the biggest struggles he's going to have, there's three things probably. It's the first one you kind of already alluded to, which is it's such a positive, high energy um, style of play that... When Spurs lose the ball in the final third, as every team will do, if they don't win it back immediately from the counter press, there's going to be gaps which other teams can hit quickly and, and gaps in behind. It's going to be a very open style of football. So that's one thing to have to deal with. And Spurs will concede goals on transition. And there's no there's no way of playing that is infallible, you know, and, and that is a weakness to, to his way of playing. The, the second weakness is, the second issue is that, unfortunately, I think that the only reason Ange, for me, if Ange Postecoglou doesn't succeed at Tottenham, I don't think it's going to be down to him. I think it's going to be down to the narrative that will be around him before he's even managed his first game. So he's coming into a team that has been built for a very different way of playing. Um, he's going to have to adapt that. There's going to have to be a ton of changes. And that way of playing, final third chance creation, the movements, the rotations, the fluidity, the knowing when to run ahead of the ball, when to drop behind the ball, all when to give players freedom, when not to. All of those kind of things, they take time to coach. And you even saw that from his start at Celtic. He, he lost his, his first game against Michelin, I believe, then lost exactly. then lost his first game versus Hearts. Yeah, so, you know, and it took, and people were like, oh, here we go. The problem, so it takes time, but that was with better players. Uh, that was with players in a league where they're far better than the rest around them. So it's probably going to take a little bit longer at Spurs. But the problem is going to be is that if they, let's say the first six games of the season, if they draw to win two and lose two, for example, we know what the media is going to do. They're going to go, is it is the job too big for him? Then the you know, fans are going to start panicking about that. And before he's even had time to, 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 to tear it down and build it back up again, people are going to be baying for his blood because he hasn't got that, that superstardom CV. So he hasn't got that kind of um, ground initial... Honest, yeah. Ground, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, and that's not his fault, but that's the narrative that football can have. The third issue I would say is that when you are so set in stone in your way of playing like it is with this style of football there's there's always going to be a ceiling to that unless you buy the best players and the, the players that are better than the league so there's a reason why for example Man City have always won the league under Guardiola or won it for the last five seasons or something but haven't won the Champions League until probably this season it's because they're so set in their way of playing they've got far better players than the rest of the league so they'll win enough games to win the league. They'll win, you know, eight out of 10 games or nine out of 10 games. And that will be enough to win the league. That's not always going to be the case in the Champions League. You're going to have to cut with being punched in the face a little bit. Spurs, for them to get the best players in the league, they're going to have to spend a ton of money. They're competing against five, six other clubs. So where's the ceiling going to be with this style of football if Spurs don't have the best players in the league? So... Those would be the three things that I would look at. But I think the, the, the first thing to say is that the, the football will definitely be a brand of football that most fans will get on side with. And I think he'll definitely at least help build the club to be in a better place than it currently is. Yeah, I mean, one of Andrew's big strengths, and I, I wanted to talk to you about this from coming from a coaching perspective yourself, is that not only is he an excellent coach, and I think we've seen that in the development of players throughout his tenure at pretty much every club he's been at. You know, we saw him do it at Yokohama. We saw him do it at Brisbane Raw. We saw him do it with the Australian national team, where obviously the brand of football is different. And I think that's uh, something to kind of hang on to in that he took that Australia team and beat bigger and better opponents 
by outplaying them and outrunning them. And, and that was something that I think can, can kind of translate into this situation. He also played a 3-4-3 with Australia, which is maybe something to just bear in mind. But it's, I, th I think that he has a very, very unique duality in that he is an incredible coach and also an incredible talent spotter. And that's something that we don't see very often from coaches. You know, you have the most incredibly minded coaches in the world, the likes of your peps and, and clops who go out there and, and bring players to a new level, but rely on other people to kind of do the recruitment side of things. And just very headstrong with these kind of things. And, and look, again, we talk mm. about double-edged swords. So much of this with Tottenham is double-edged swords because I know, and I've watched Ange at Celtic bring in players and people are going, who is that? He'll never play. He's never played in anyone and, you know, go on and absolutely ruin the league in their first three to four months at Celtic Park. But you go to a club like Spurs where Daniel Levy has been so in control of transfers, who loves a club signing, who loves someone who's going to come in and get noses turned and put people out of joint. Is that going to work with a manager like Ange, who's incredibly headstrong? You have to remember, this is a man who walked away from the Australian job seven months before a World Cup because there was just too much noise in the press about whether he was playing the right, amount, the right style of football and so much criticism because they went through a certain long road to get to that World Cup. He is not afraid to down tools and walk away if he doesn't think things are working out in the way that he wants them to. Yeah, but what I would say is that you know, no one has ever gotten to the top of anything without being headstrong and having, you know, the utmost belief in your ability to, to perform the, the, the task at hand. It, Levy has to learn his lesson. Like, he has to. I think one thing I would say about what Daniel Levy has done at Tottenham, he's been a rem incredible from getting the club. When he first took over or became chairman, there was, let's say, it was performing at an F or an E minus or whatever you want to talk about it. He's done brilliantly at getting the club to go from an E to performing up to a C plus or a B minus. He has clearly massively struggled from that last little bit of getting the club to go from a B minus up to an A star. He just hasn't been able to do that one so far. And a lot of that has clearly been him looking to take too much control over the football side of things. Now, of course, if Ange Postacoglu went to him tomorrow and said, right, I want to spend a hundred million pounds on, I don't know, just in cuckoo. Oh, I mean, he's gone to Chelsea, isn't he? But, but yeah, you know, fine, yeah. That, that kind of thing. And I want to, yeah, and eighty million pounds on Ugarte. He's about to join PSG. I want fifty million pounds on on that fullback. All of a sudden, you know, four hundred million pounds. Then Levy would be in his right to go. Whoa, 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 whoa! We don't do that here. Well, we can't do that, and that's fair. By the same token, be on the same boat and you know have the same alignment of you know, going in and allow the manager, if the direction is agreed upon, allow the manager to get on with his job. So I personally think it's a bit of a cop out excuse that the teams with the most money have to be the ones that succeed the most. I don't think that has to be the case. There is an incredible amount of talent globe. Brighton's managed to find it, but you've got to have the personality and the balls and the conviction in yourself and your approach and your belief to go out there and back yourself and do it. So why can't you sign the Moises Caicedo before he becomes a £16 million pounds player. Now, I get that it's easy for me to say that on the outside, and my job isn't online at a Tottenham Hotspur where you're maybe allowed to fail if you've tried. So I tried by getting the best players. If you fail at Tottenham Hotspur because you've bought, you know, relative unknowns and they haven't worked out, then it's like, what are you doing? You can't have that. But that's where we need someone like an Ange Postacoglu who is headstrong to go, well, I think this is a good player. I think we need to get him in and I think he'll work. And then it takes the club to back that approach and go from there. If there's those clashes and collisions, you can have like opinion, you can have disagreements. Not every, you know, people, people think that Pep Guardiola gets what he wants. He won't, there'll, there'll be disagreements that he will have at the club. Pep Guardiola wouldn't have got every single thing he would have wanted at yeah. the club. But as long as the overall journey, you're, you're, you're on that same road, then it should lead to being more successful. It's when there's those collisions along the way that it leads to, the absolute chaos that you've seen at the club for the last two years. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Completely agree. Last question for me, Harry, is that we've seen Celtic thrive with a striker in the form of Kyogo, who is an incredibly, incredibly efficient presser and who mm. leads the line defensively time and time again. Now, Spurs have a very difficult decision to make this summer on the future of Harry Kane, whether he walks mm. away for free next summer or they can get a fee in for him this year. My big takeaway is that obviously any good manager worth his salt, if you have Harry Kane at your disposal, will use Harry Kane to the best of his abilities. I'm not suggesting that for a second that Postacoglu wouldn't be able to get anything out of Kane. Yeah. So let's just make that clear before I get misquoted everywhere. Yeah. Um, but 
part of me does think that if this is the summer that Spurs sell Kane, and if it, that does happen, then Postacoglu is the kind of manager who will look to come away from the formula that has worked for Spurs or has saved Spurs in so many years. And that actually might be the answer to actually dealing with the problem in that if you bring a manager who goes, right, I need to find a replacement for Harry Kane who did exactly the same things and just wasn't as good at them, you're going to struggle because there are very yeah. few players. He's a unicorn in so many ways who can mm -hmm. do what Kane does. But if you look to switch the system at that point and bring in someone different who runs a different kind of or plows a different kind of furrow, then maybe Postacoglu is the manager to do that. And I think that that could be, you know, it could be construed as a positive or a negative, but it's just something I thought it was interesting to discuss. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. It, I agree with your first point. I think that, you know, people will say, well, Harry Kane's not going to work at Postacoglu because he's not high pressing. If you have Harry Kane at your disposal and you can't make it work for him, That's on you're you. the issue. Yeah. It's on you, yeah. Right, you know. Um, but to be fair, Harry Kane's that kind of player where throw him into any environment, he's going to succeed. He's just that kind of player. Um, and that is very hard to find. Kind of what you're saying, and it was actually something we discussed the first ever time I was on the podcast with you guys, that it's, it sounds silly to say, as long as the, there's a contingency plan and as long as the club is well run, it shouldn't necessarily be a disaster if a club is in a situation to sell their best player. The problem Spurs have right now is there is too many other fires to put out. And Spurs were in a strength, in a position of power where... Yeah, they were pretty set in their squad. They're happy with where they are. So let's say, for example, Man City he lost Haaland this summer. For whatever reason, they say, oh, I want to go join Real Madrid for £200 million, whatever it is. It wouldn't all fall apart because no. place, there'll be a contingency plan for the next one and we just go from there and we adapt in certain ways. It's what Ferguson was a master at. The problem with Spurs right now is that there's too many other fires to fill out. So they've all, there's already a big job on. They're going to have to get a new goalkeeper. They're going to have to get probably one or two new centre-backs. They're going to have to get a, probably a midfielder that can pick apart the opposition, maybe another forward. That's all before the problem of if Harry Kane stays or goes. Now, if you add Harry Kane leaving on top of that, I mean, Jesus Christ, if it, if his job to rebuild this squad wasn't hard enough, it just got a lot harder. Down to the mismanagement of the club for the last three years, because you would want to be in a position where the strength of, uh, you know, it's, it's a good example is Brighton. If Brighton lose Marcius Cossido, this if they lose Cossido and McAllister, they'll be fine. Yeah, Brighton are going to be just fine because you know there's going to be a contingency plan that will replace the next one. Now, obviously, now and again, you could. It's hard to consistently replace talent, and that's why you can see clubs eventually fall away, like Southampton did and stuff like that. But you at least know there'll be a plan to replace that. There'll be the next Cossido. There'll be the next McAllister, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Spurs at the moment, they don't have anything like that. There's too many fires to put out. So I personally believe. If Harry Kane was to leave this summer, it would be an absolute disaster for Spurs and Ange Postacoglu. Now, of course, they'd adapt and find other ways. Richarlison might be used more in a different way and he would score more goals. But the beauty of having someone like Harry Kane is even if there's a fire going, it's like that dog meme, you know, when there's a fire going around and he's like, this is fine. Harry Kane is that dog. He is, this is fine. The rest can be, the, the, the fullbacks could be having a nightmare. The system could be like, you know, not working, whatever it is. He will still score enough goals to win you points. And almost like a get out of jail free card where the manager can like do his stuff over time. It's okay. We can work on this over time because Harry will save us. Um, if that goes, really, really difficult. So I think that right now Spurs, if, if Spurs want to be get back to where they are, have to risk it with Harry Kane for this summer. They're not in a position of strength to replace someone like him on top of all the other stuff they have to replace yeah. and change. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Harry, thank you so much as ever for your insight. Thank you for jumping on to talk Andrew with me today. I've seen the smile on your face suggests that there's positivity radiating out of the camp right now. And uh, and that's always a good thing to see. But uh, we're looking forward to having you back on very, very soon. Do you want to just remind the listeners where they can find you? Yeah, it's uh, hbrooks underscore coach. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Harry, always a pleasure having you on. We'll have you back on very, very shortly on Ranks FC. Thanks a million, mate. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Much appreciated.
Well, thank you so much to Harry there. In a moment, we're going to be joined by Alex at EuroExpert on Twitter to talk a little bit more about some of the tactical nuances of what Angie's systems look like and also a couple of players who might thrive in and out of the Ange Postacoglu system. But before we do that, I want to just throw to a segment from our Patreon episode, which happened last week when the links to Ange and Spurs started to get a little bit stronger. This is between Sam Sam, Dean and myself discussing what Ange brings in terms of character to a club and how fans might react to his appointment. I can understand some of the trepidation around this. I think that you've seen managers come in at Spurs who have struggled to control this dressing room, who've struggled to stamp their authority on things. And I can understand why fans or at least why fans are, are, are worried because I don't think a Tottenham crowd is going to give Ange Postacoglu the time that they would have given a Julian Nagelsmann now whether that's right or wrong I just think that's how this is going to play out and I think that kind of scares me from a Tottenham perspective and more than that it scares me from an Ange perspective well you've also forgotten mate it's 57 <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Tottenham were worried about this weren't they they are. I, I found out why they wanted a. They wanted like to be like everyone else and have a young and up and coming manager. So like they wanted like they liked the profile of a Nagelsmann or um, somebody like that. And you know, to be honest, like even Ryan Mason in that in that sense, they they like how young he is and like. But it's like that's Christ. not the priority. The age does not matter, guys. You're gonna have to get over this one. You need to look at who's <laughs> best for this job. Um, <laughs> It's so yeah. bad, isn't it? I've uh, seen a lot of the Tottenham fans point out that, you know, Angie's career path to date is, you know, it's pretty modest. Um, I've actually just flicked onto his Wikipedia while we're talking to read it out and someone's already put him in as Tottenham Hotspur manager. So congrats to Ange. <laughs> um, but obviously, as in like a senior capacity, Brisbane Raw into Melbourne Victory, into Australia, into Yokohama in the City Football Group, and then into Celtic. Like it's obviously not an illustrious career path. And I've seen the point made a few times. You don't discover elite coaches at 57. So stop defending him. He's not good enough for us. So I think that's that's very and a very obtuse way of thinking of things. You know, development mm. is not linear. We say that for players. It, I think it applies to everybody in the game. I'm looking at Andrew's career path and I'm just wondering if for the first 40 three years of his life he was even that interested in becoming a manager at this <laughs> level like like it, like things click for different people at different times don't they like yeah just just because you're not a, a, like a proper manager at age 38 nowadays doesn't it doesn't mean anything at, at this point so <sighs> i've been as perplexed as you jack um at the at the sort of mobilizing against postacoglu and I, uh, it doesn't make sense to me but you know people don't really watch it's not going to work. This is the problem. It's not going to work because it's going to be, it's different to Graham Potter, but it's similar in the sense that like fans aren't convinced from day one. You're not going to get the time that you need for the rebuild and the type of profile of players that you will, he's worked with in the past. This is not it. That, that changing room is not won over by it. Most of them won't even know who he is. Um, like that's genuine as well. Like a lot of I know, them will, gen- yeah. will like they It sounds won't. bad, but it's true. It's true. It's just, it's just a fact. And, you know, yeah, he's he's won uh, Celtic, the, the Scottish title in both seasons he's been there. Like, that, that's great. Um, he's one went away from a treble, but I do, his European record yeah. hasn't been great. And that's it. And, like, the problem is the Scottish Premier League is, doesn't really translate to top six Premier League as a manager. Like, that's, it, there's no, there's no, no real evidence that, that that works. Like, like, look, Brendan Rodgers might have gone from Celtic there and made the jump back, but he'd obviously already built his profile highly before that point. Steven Gerrard looks great at Rangers, um, goes to Aston Villa, doesn't look so great. And, the, you know, Gerrard even already had, like, I know, like, there was no, like, particular fondness from Villa fans, and, like, he played there, but, like, he was an England legend. They knew what he was about, and, like, they would have given him some, cut him Leeway. some slack if you yeah. think, yeah. That he's not going to get that, and so this manager will be gone by January if things aren't going well. And there's, that, that's the sad fact uh, at play here. He's also, I'm just not convinced, he's going to be able to implement the changes that he's been able to make at Celtic at Tottenham because of the hierarchy that he's going to be working in. Because they're going to have a new sporting director throwing his weight around trying to make changes. Daniel Levy doesn't allow certain things to happen. I think he would find himself very frustrated. It was surprised. I mean. 
when I was looking at this a couple of weeks ago, I was told like he's not. I don't know if I said this on here or not, but he, he's he's not a yes man. He won't just say okay, I'll get on with that. And oh yeah, just, yeah, yeah. You tell me what to do, and I'll I'll just do it. He's not that kind of character, apparently. So again. Do you want a situation here where you've got someone butting heads with, with Levy from day one? I, I don't know that you do. I flip well, you... just on the fact that, that, that what Andrew's built, I think, in a very quick time at Celtic. And I, I agree with you that obviously the jump's different, but no managers have ever transferred from, I don't know, the SPL or the J League and built Dynasty. Wenger did. Um, that, Wenger did, yeah. Martin O'Neill. And, 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 and famously, Sir Alex Ferguson. That's um, like, just so, just so we're mean... clear that that was a joke. Um, no. like, but <laughs> the, point, the point being that I think that what Andrew's built at Celtic, and, and to be honest, you know, I remember when he came in, there were a lot of people saying he won't last six months at Celtic. And within a very, very short period of time, he built a side, he turned around that element of, of dominance that had been secured at Rangers under that 55th title. And he flipped that script immediately, pretty much, and went on one set with the title back and has gone on to win, well, he's one game from the treble this year. I should not actually suggest that he's won it yet. But I think that there is an element that he's gone and built a culture very, very quickly and fans have really bought into him. And I think that there's an element there. And look, obviously things are different in different places, but Celtic is a big club. You know, we're and you know, there was a there was a thing on Twitter yesterday, I so saw I think it was a talk sport thing, where Darren Bent and Andy Goldstein were having an argument about whether Celtic would actually be a uh, would uh, whether Tottenham would actually be a jump up, not in terms of where the club live in terms of the the standings or, or UEFA, but in terms of what a club represents and, and the fan base and a the culture, then actually from Celtic, he's gone this at a big club with a big history and big expectations. And I think that there is an element of that that you go, that's impressive in itself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that absolutely. Like, I'd love to give him the benefit of the doubt here and give him a crack at it. But yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, there aren't there aren't many Premier League clubs of this size that take a chance on someone that doesn't have well, normally English pedigree, but even European pedigree in this in this case, I guess. Like, I don't know if you can count Celtic in that or not. You, I guess it's it's debatable. Like one of the the big arguments is that um, why he might be in for this job is that uh, they've got a a guy called Scott Munn coming into the, to Tottenham's hierarchy that is a big admirer uh, of Postecoglou, um, and. I don't know if he's worked with him before or if he just knows him from the past. Um, that wasn't clear to me, but... Um, is he from City he, Football Group? I bet he is. He is, isn't he? Scott Munn. Yeah. So I'm trying to... F- so he's he's definitely crossed paths in, in CFG, yeah. for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, he was the chief executive of City Football Group China, I believe. Yeah, he's, he's, he's aware of him. So that's probably why this is back on the radar. I mean, Andrew's been mentioned for a while, um, but now it's probably ramping up because of that. Let's see. I'd love to see it. I'd love yeah. to see it. I've just got it's my a, doubts about whether it can work. He's a good human and a good coach. And those kind of people deserve their shot at these kind of jobs, I think. Um, yeah. And I wish, the, I wish the atmosphere and the, the context was different. But Dean is right. You know, Dean was right from the word go. He was like, Potter, Chelsea, it's not going to work. I trust his instinct on this kind of things because he knows, he knows that they are the land. He's also a brutal realist, unlike Jack and I, who dream and dream and dream. <laughs> and um, I'm, yeah, I'm sort of equal parts terrified and excited for this one because yeah. I, I also really like Ange and I'd really like to see Tottenham go down that route. Welcome back to Ranks FC. And I'm delighted to say that I'm back with another old friend of this podcast, Alex, the Euro expert, who some of you will have seen on our transfer deadline day stream earlier this year. Alex, it's great to have you on the pod proper and back on Rax FC. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to be back on. I've been waiting for this. It's been uh, really come, good to come back on since that transfer deadline day. I remember that very clear. It was a very nice time. So I'm excited to chat to you again. Yeah, amazing. So we've had a kind of various bits and bobs on this podcast. It's been a bit of a mishmash. We've done lots of things about what it means for Spurs with Dean. We just talked to Harry Brooks about the kind of coaching elements of it. But I wanted to get into it with you a little bit about the tactical elements and how that translates across to Tottenham. Because there's been a lot about what Ange is and what he kind of represents. But I think what we'll see on the pitch is is going to be another kind of element of this. So I kind of wanted to just go into 
what it looks like, an Ange Postacoglu team on the pitch and, and, and kind of how it translates. We've seen a lot of his formation as a 4-3-3. Now, he did play a 3-4-3 at one point with, with Australia, but that was a long time ago. So I'm going to assume that he's going to kind of use the principles that he, he's been in, have been in place at Celtic. And, and we talk a little bit about what it looked like at Celtic, and then I think we can try and translate that onto maybe what it might look like at Spurs. So for you, what does, what does Ange Postacoglu's Celtic team look like on the pitch? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I think as well, I mean, the other guys who've been on the podcast episode have probably outlined this as well. But just to really make it clear, we can discuss what Anders' team are like against all manner of opposition uh, and and avoid talking about them playing against the lower reaches of Scottish football, which are obviously ranked very low in Europe. But I think his games against Rangers, particularly this year, have been really diverse. And they, I think they really encapsulate what he's about which is often trying to match the opposition. There was a game, I think it was in April, um, a Glasgow derby, where Rangers were causing Celtic a lot of trouble by basically piling all of their players on the left-hand side. And Celtic matched this both in and out of possession. They would, uh, they were just sitting there to, out of possession, they had Moy coming in as well. They had the left-back tucking in over and it was, really about kind of adapting to Rangers. And then when they did get the ball, they pushed their midfielders very wide and just trying to find those pockets of space. And then there's been other times where I think it was more of a recent game. It wasn't the one they lost. It was a bit of a tighter match when Rangers are sitting much more in a deep block. I think this is a good example of what you could expect from Spurs against lower reaches of the Premier League, where Andrew Celtic were just saying, right, if Rangers are parking their players back, we're going to have to kind of find a balance between a good rest defence and trying to get a goal. And they just piled led midfielders into the box. And the logic was, if we fire in enough low crosses, even if the ball gets intercepted, then we're going to get a rebound and we're going to get a chance to score. And I think in that game, they in fact did. So you got to say about what an Ange team does look like on the pitch. I think it's one that likes to take risks and is adaptable and is keen to change in game. Not quite on the Nathan Jones level, but at a moderate amount. Yeah, I mean, th- this is it. I, I, there's there's various bits with Ange that I, I really like. And that in-game kind of management and, and ability to shift patterns around while staying within a structure, I think is a really crucial element to the way they play. So, you know, there's been so much said. And I think this is interesting about Ange's philosophy. And he's always come out and said, look, I want football to be for the people. I want it to, to be something that fans come and enjoy. I want for those 90 minutes them to be able to forget their troubles and watch the team and enjoy themselves. And it's something that's been incredibly well received at Celtic, I think, generally. It's something that's a bit of a callback to the olden days of, of what Celtic law was about. But I also think it's something that can translate into Tottenham in terms of those philosophies. But that doesn't mean sticking with the same thing over and over again if, if it's not working. Now, his commitment to attacking football, that's not going to change. But the way in which he enacts that on the pitch it, it is a really interesting one. I think, you know, what we've seen and, and, and what we can kind of expect in terms of if he translates this model perfectly, it won't work like that. It never does, right? We've seen managers shift their tactics, shift things around. Thomas Tuchel coming to Chelsea, compiling completely new tactics about how to make things work. But I think from Andrew, we can expect some level of translation. And my big questions are around certain players in this Tottenham team and, and how they fit into an Ange system. This Tottenham team is built for three at the back. We've seen f- wing backs brought in in the form of Pedro Porro, in the form of Ivan Perisic. We've seen midfielders who kind of work in a, in a double midfield block in, in the likes of Bentancur and Hoybier. I don't think all of this is going to translate. Are there any players who stand out as being obvious Ange players to you and ones that stand out as being obviously not Ange players? Oh, I could get Spurs fans really excited here, mate. I don't I don't mean to, but well, some Spurs fans at least. I, I really think there's a room there's room for Tangi and Dumbele to come in under Ange and find the role. And I'm not just saying that for the hopeful reasons, and in fairness, we don't know his future. Like who knows, there could be a headliner's recording this podcast saying he's off to Saudi Arabia with some money they're yep. piling into the game but you can look at and what he's done in um, Australia with different players he's brought in from the wilderness and kind of turned into players like they've just played the best football their careers I think Callum McGregor's I kind of see a lot of Andumbel, uh, Callum McGregor and 
uh, Tangi and Dembele, which is a sentence I never thought I would say. And the reason <laughs> is because uh, <laughs> and Dembele is superb at receiving the ball under pressure and he's clearly an excellent passer. He just doesn't have that that output in the final third, let's say. And I think Napoli have kind of found that as well. That's why he's not always consistently played. I think Andrew will look at him and see see the qualities there. And if there's ever a manager, I'm sure we've said this about other coaches, but if there's ever a manager to get the best mentally and physically out of Tangi and Dembele, I think it would be Andrew Postacoglu. And I can see him definitely having a home deeper in midfield and playing a really nice role in build-up as Spurs take more control of the ball. Because let's not forget, I think, 90% of Underbelly's career has been under managers who are happy to forgive possession if it means they get to enact their own principles. It's, this would be the first time we see Underbelly getting fed the ball consistently, and I think that will make a big impact. Yeah, well, I, that was one I hadn't even considered, and I, I think that's uh, that's that's why they're good. And that's why it's, uh, that's why we get you on, Alex, for little nuggets like <laughs> that. Um, I, I'd forgotten that Tangi and Dembele wasn't a, was still a Spurs player, so that, that's one to consider. One I'm a bit worried about is Pedro Porro. Now, a player I really, really like, uh, a player that a lot of people really, really like. And when he came into Spurs, this system seemed to be something that he would thrive under. And his fullbacks at Celtic have tended to tuck in to make that kind of 3-2 shield or a 2-3 shield in this regard, where the two centre-backs will stay behind and the two fullbacks will tuck in next to the deepest midfielder in order to provide that rest defence. I can't see Pedro Porro doing this. Now, there have been moments in this season where Greg Taylor has ended up in the opposition box and, and has scored goals and important goals for Celtic and, and just leaned left. He could lean right in this regard in the same way. Alistair Johnson, a centre-back converted to a right-back and has been the kind of changing force there in, in actually getting Greg Taylor forward because Jovanovic did that on the other side further up. So we know he can go both ways. Is there a scene here you can see where Ben Davis starts to tuck inside Although I do wonder if Ben Davis becomes a centre-back under Ange because he's comfortable in possession and Ange likes his centre-backs having the ball. But if he became the kind of covering defender and allowed Porro to, to get further forward and start to invert further up the pitch, because we know the ability he has in order to score goals and, and create things in, in the attacking third. I think, actually, you're maybe underestimating Pedro Porro here. Um, I wouldn't blame you, in fairness, because... If the question was, have we seen anything from Pedro Porro to suggest he could play in a back four at Tottenham? The answer would be categorically no. And then it would be followed up by saying, go and watch the game against Newcastle, yeah. you idiot. There's no way you can do it. But I think it's worth saying, well, two things, uh, something you guys would have already spoke about as well. Andrew's a terrific coach and he's yeah. incessant on improving these players. And so you can see Porro improving his defensive capabilities. But also another point, at Sporting, he did actually tuck into a back three more often than not. In fact, I even got corrected on it when I first made a bit of content about him when I said, yeah, you, you can see him tucking into a back three, but really pushes wide. And quite a lot of Sporting fans said to me, he said, no, more often than not this season, as good as he is at crossing, the ball will go down the left and it would be down to Poro to tuck into the back three and often sometimes build back out from the right as the ball switches over. So I think there is actually a role where we can see Poro moving over and in regards to ben davies i think yeah that then there is definitely a possibility of him playing at center back and perhaps a more obvious solution is him going to left uh going to left back tucking in and just letting poro push forward but i think spurs really need to reinforce at center back and i'm actually not sure ben davies is up to the desired quality i think he's better than most of their players at building out from the back but is he at a top six standard i don't know personally so maybe it might just be about building things out. But I think it is worth saying as well, and this is a point I wanted to mention um, as I was talking about Porro, I almost forgot um, to kind of counter it here, and maybe you'll be aware as well. This could go badly wrong because one player at Celtic who's not worked out this year was their bigger money signing, was a Bernabé, the Argentinian left back. Uh, he, in Argentina, uh, I managed to watch quite a bit of him because I luckily had a Y Scout trial. Thank you very much, Y Scout. And I could see he was, you know, the archetypal overlapping left back, constantly yeah. bombing forward. If he had the ball, he was driving forward with it. He wasn't passing. And he's really struggled at Celtic this season. Yeah. Of course, he's moved from Argentina to Scotland. That's expected. But that is a cautionary tale. And I'm sure Adoji and Poro will be looking at and thinking, hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I, I think it's a really interesting one. And Better Bay is someone that we've, yeah, I think there was a lot of hype when he came in and, you know, pretty much all Andrew's signings have worked. And that is the one that stands out as being like, a, oh, that one might have, that's going to happen when you, you know, when you're starting to scout from further reaches and something Andrew's brilliant at is, is mixing these things up and maybe discovering. And then look, we've seen at Brighton that they are being praised head over heels for finding players in parts of the world that other people are struggling to find talent in. And, and this is something that Ange has done for years, bringing people in for, from kind of regions that maybe haven't been given the spotlight as, as much as they deserve. So I think it's a really interesting one. Just kind of final point, Alex, and one thing is Spurs don't have a first-choice goalkeeper anymore. You know, Hugo Lloris is leaving at the end of this season. Fraser Forster is covered towards the end of the year, but you can't imagine he's going to be a, a first choice going forward. What should Spurs be looking for in, in, in a keeper here, aside from them being you know, a decent shot stopper? Because there's a lot of question marks over how you build the team out in an Ange model and get a keeper to, to work within that. And it's something that a lot of Premier League clubs have struggled with. Yeah, and uh, I think it's... The the disadvantage for Spurs here is that they're going to be looking for a keeper that everyone else is going to be looking for. And it, you make a really valid point there. For an Ange team to build up from out the back, I mean, there's a great line in The Athletic, actually, in a big long read, which I think Charlie Eccleshare did after being in 4,000 words in Arnie Slot, so he deserves the shout-out here. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, when Andrew was, I think, coaching in Australia, uh, a player made a mistake during build-up and and he cost the team a goal and every other player at the team got shouted at because he didn't offer a good passing option and he praised the guy for still trying to build out. So it's unquestionable. He's going to be looking for a keeper here who's comfortable with the ball with his feet, more so than Joe Hart at Celtic. Um, they, they, yeah, but like we said, the market here is really thin. The only two names I can properly think of uh, are Diogo Costa or a David Raya. And Manchester United are likely to get one of them and probably have first dibs on the other. I, I've been saying for a while about Albon Lafont could go to Spurs. I mean, following in Hugo Lloris's footsteps, he's a really good shot stopper at Nantes. And, you know, he's been talented for a very long time. But I think if anyone other than Andrew had come in, I think this move could still work because I think yeah. there's room for him to grow with the ball mm -hmm. at his feet. But that quality of being comfortable with the ball that's a that's something that needs to happen now. I don't think you can buy for potential there. I think that's going to be a must for Ange going into the summer. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And Diego Costa has just come out and said that, you know, my heart belongs to Porter. Now we've seen people do this before and, and, and then move on. But it, it does feel like maybe a move that looked on the cards might not be on the cards quite as much and over there. Andre Anana feels like a potential option if Inter are short of cash, but every step they get further in the Champions League seems to, seems I mean, to change that. I mean, Andrew Onana, fun fact, I just checked. Um, for people who are fans of post-short expected goals on Footbreath's uh, statistics, Andre Onana is the best keeper in the Champions League this season uh, by yeah. a country mile. And I, I don't know how into your uh, stats here are um, and the listeners, but on average, a, like a keeper across 38 games will save maybe like four or five goals above normal rate, and that's really good. Anana in 13 Champions League games, so 12 Champions League games even, uh, he saved 7.8 goals more than expected. He's actually had a like a phenomenal year. So I think you're absolutely right. That that price, maybe six months ago, could have been reasonable. Or I, I think you need to be a very rich Champions League club to get him out now. Yeah, yeah, and Spurs don't have that European kind of flexibility to play with. Uh, it might be one for them to visit the Brentford Community Stadium and just get <laughs> in there first, I think, maybe at this point might be the answer. Uh, Alex, it's been a real, real pleasure having you on again. Do you want to just let the listeners know where they can find you? Oh, cheers, man. Yes, you can find me at TikTok on YouTube or on Twitter at EuroExpert. You can find me any questions about Ange to Spurs. I'll be uploading a video this weekend, probably on the sort of players we could see stay or leave at Spurs under his tactics, basically an extension of the good conversation we've just had. So uh, hopefully I'll see you there. Absolutely. Alex, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, man.
Well, thanks once again to Alex for his insights there. Thank you to everybody who's been part of this episode. Thank you very much to Mr. Harry Brooks as well for his insights earlier. And of course, to Sam and Dean as always here on Ranks FC. This is the end of the episode. We'll be back tomorrow with a Champions League preview. We're going to have a Europa Conference League review on our patreon so please do make sure that you get over there if you go to the link in the description you'll be able to join us on patreon there's free trials going on so anyone can have a look at what we're doing there. over the summer we're gonna have in more transfer episodes and blitz transfer episodes with dean on there basically breaking down all the happening stories of the day so it's a good a time as any to join us over on patreon thank you so much for listening to today's episode and we will see you very shortly take it easy gang peace